Well, good morning. I'm not Josh, but I've been here before, so you guys know me. So it's good to be back uh, with you guys and uh, kind of cover for uh, Josh while he is taking care of his little ones. Um, so let's, uh, let's start out this morning with um, prayer, and I think i got to turn this thing on, right? Okay, got it. Um, so, we do have some prayer requests, which we'll get to in a minute, but um, let's go ahead and start our day with just an opening prayer. So, Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time that we have to gather together. Lord, what a privilege and an honor it is to come before you, to kneel at your feet, to know, Lord, that Whatever is going on, you know everything about it. Lord, your word tells us that you knit us together in your womb, and you know the hairs on our heads. You know the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore. Father, you know everything. And Lord, for us who barely know anything, to be able to come before you, and to kneel at your feet and even make a request is such an honor. And this morning, Lord, we ask that you would bless this time together. Thank you, Lord, that we can come together knowing that your word tells us that when two or more are gathered in your name, that you are here in our midst. And Lord, we love that. We love that you are here with us and that you are going to enjoy our worship. You are going to teach us today. And so, Father, I pray that you would give us ears to hear and minds to understand those things which you are going to speak of today. So we ask, Lord, that you would teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. Man. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> um, we usually have a, I hate to call it a routine, um, because uh, routine indicates something that we just do over and over because we have to do it. But it's an honor for us to go through um, and pray for others. And so um, I have a list that I usually go through on Sundays, but I also have a list from you folks um, that my dad uh, put together as well. So we'll go over those. Um, we usually start by uh, talking about Operation Christmas Child. I don't know if you guys do that here or not, um, but I know that we just got our packet in the mail um, from Samaritan's Purse. It's a great program, um, and we've been kind of helping the kids out. But the most important thing we can do is pray for them. Uh, even if we can't provide, um, we know times are tough uh, and the economy stinks, um, but God doesn't. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, um, which means he's loaded. So if we ask him to help those that are in need, especially those that are in far greater need, maybe they don't even have any shoes or, or whatever it may be, um, but uh, the Lord can meet those needs. And their greatest need, of course, is Jesus and uh, um, I love the fact that that particular um, program does hit uh, the nail on the head, so to speak, and minister to, to those folks and share the gospel, the good news um, with uh, folks. So we also pray for um, our government. Do you think that our government needs prayer? Yeah. Oh, my. Boy, I f feel like we have lost our way um, like no other time in history, perhaps. Um, but that's what the scripture says is going to happen in the last days. And so we need to, to pray for those that are in authority over us, as uh, Jesus would say. Um, but also, um, I think it's our privilege um, and honor to be able to vote um, and that kind of thing, which is coming up. So pray for that as well. Um, so 
there's a lot of things to think about. And then, of course, um, for us locally, we always pray for those that are around our community. Um, and in our situation in Happy Camp, um, the Yeti fire is uh, essentially out. You know, there's a couple little smokes here and there. But further up uh, the river, closer toward Wairika, uh, the Klamath River folks um, up there are still uh, going through it as they lost about oh, 80 or 90 houses, I think, something like that. Um, and a few folks died there. And then, you know, the mill fire uh, out towards weed and a couple people died there and so it's been kind of a, a rough year for Siskiyou County um, Last couple of years has been pretty rough, but I also know that you guys have um, Some fires up here glad that it's not you know too close by but you know, um, I mean growing up here um, This is also home for me. So it holds a, um, a special place in my heart especially when I think about like Galice and going down the, the wild and scenic area of the Rogue. Uh, and, you know, and uh, my son-in-law is also a firefighter. Um, and so we pray for, for those folks as well, because uh, that's a tough job, um, especially in like Happy Camp or even in that Galice area. Um, that's some steep country. So um, we pray for that. Um, other folks that um, are going through issues with cancer, uh, Jim, um, Dory, and Frank, although Frank has got kind of a clean bill of health um, right now, and uh, that's a good thing. It's always nice to get that from the doctor. So, um, and then other issues, uh, Jimmy with back problems, Dolly uh, with a knee issue, um, and she also just recently lost her daughter, um, and uh, that's kind of a tough situation. Uh, Buster for health, uh, Stan in Virginia for health. My dad, of course, you know, he's um, uh, ill this morning, but I did get to spend a, a little bit of time with him yesterday going over. We were going to go over and go surfing, and the forecast was two to three feet, so we thought, all right, we're good to go. We got there, and it was like one foot, and it's like, okay, I, it, we're not going to be able to do anything. But we had a good time just hanging out and uh, found a couple of good places to eat. Ate too much is, is the case, but it seems like he's getting a cold. So um, uh, pray for him if you would. And then uh, Denny and Donna, they came for backup, some support. So um, they decided to join us this morning. Um, so it's good to see them. Um, and uh, Judy Peabody, her mom for health. Terry Everett for health. Um, Steve. And Fran Smith, um, he's got uh, ALS, and uh, that's a tough thing. Um, but uh, they're working through some of those difficulties. Uh, Candace with lupus, Debbie Taylor's mother uh, for um, some continued care. Uh, Dan Bushy um, for improved health. Speaking of Dan Bushy, he's a gentleman that should have died probably um, 11, 12 years ago now, something like that. Uh, he had cancer um, in his sinuses. They were going to take one of his eyes, uh, and then when they took apart his, uh, his um, face, I guess you could say, um, they found that he had cancer in both eyes. They just sewed him back together and sent him home and said, prepare for, you know, your service. And uh, he's still with us. God is uh, gracious. He's merciful, and he answers our prayers. Um, and so it's good to, to just continue to pray because he does meet our needs. Um, Christopher, his family, uh, stuck in Ukraine. And you all know the situation that's going on over there. It's pretty um, scary. Uh, Brenda Franklin, she's got some medical needs. Um, Dory's cousin, Gene, is uh, having some issues where he's having continuous strokes all the time. And so he needs um, some prayer there. Um, uh, Vicki, one of the gals at church, um, her sister-in-law, Joni, just went through some cancer uh, issues, so she's uh, recovering from surgery now. Um, and then Mark with uh, diabetic issues. And then, of course, we love to pray for our uh, unsaved loved ones. And then a few ministries that uh, we uh, pray for um, that uh, seem to request it. Clapper 
which is, um, I'm not too uh, computer savvy or, you know, I do some Facebook stuff, but not a whole lot of uh, stuff. But Clapper is a, a group that our youth pastor, who's covering for me today uh, in Happy Camp, um, is involved in. And it's got, you know, an outre outreach kind of like a Facebook um, and it's got uh, a pretty good group of folks that are going there. So we pray for that, uh, the Navigators. And then there um, is a over 70s um, surf ministry that's happening down south. And uh, so we, we lift them up in prayer. But for you guys locally, my dad said, this is um, some of your needs. Of course, many of you know that Carly, um, Josh's daughter, went up to have heart surgery. It seems like it was a successful surgery, and uh, now she's just um, recovering. Well, kids recover really quick, a lot faster than we do, um, but pray that that goes smoothly. Um, and so uh, we also know that Joey has uh, uh, the issue with diabetes as well, and it would be awesome if uh, they could just be healed done and not have to deal with that. But, you know, sometimes the Lord allows us to go through medical difficulties or difficulties just in life so that he can show us uh, his strength, his power, um, that kind of thing. But also, I am a firm believer that when we go through something difficult, that it is something that we learn how faithful God is to us so that we might share through um, through our situation to somebody else who is also going through uh, a situation. So um, embrace those difficulties so that we might help others through their difficulty. Um, Daryl Drummond, also a recovery from surgery. And then uh, my dad says, um, there are several people in the church that have heart problems. Um, and so we'll add those to the list. Any others that we can add while we're thinking about it? Okay, and if not, you can always post um, your uh, prayer request to my Facebook page. Um, I'd love to pray for folks. It's an it's a awesome opportunity for us to do that. So let's pray, and then we'll, we'll move on. So Lord, thank you that we can join together with our brothers and our sisters in uh, reaching out to you, that you might touch, you might heal, you would restore that you might lead others into truth, that, Father, you would minister to our government, that you would uh, reach out to those who are hurting or those in foreign countries that need not just a gift, um, but also, Lord, to hear of the greatest gift. Lord, each one of these names that are uh, remembered here, Lord, you know their situation. And Father, we join with them because your word tells us that wherever, uh, whenever we pray, if we pray in your name, that Father, you will meet those needs. We don't always understand what that looks like. We don't always understand how that is going to unfold. But Father, one thing we can do is trust you. And so Father, we put each of these names and situations into your hands and ask, Lord, that you would touch, that you would minister. And we thank you in advance for the glorious work that you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> well, um, we have uh, various Bible studies through the week. We have the men's prayer breakfast. I don't know what the menu is for those that are tuning in online. Um, you're just going to have to show up at 7 o'clock at the Bible Church and find out what they're serving. Um, but it's a good opportunity to again pray and uh, see what the Lord is doing. It's great when men hold other men accountable uh, because then we just become stronger in the Lord. So it's great to have that. Wednesday nights, um, we do a, uh, a book study with the folks at the Assembly of God, and we're going through a book on prayer. It's great um, to be able to do that. Um, and that happens um, at 6 p.m. at the Assembly of God. Not that any of you are going to actually drive all that way to attend, but you can lift that up in prayer. Uh, and then a women's Bible study on Thursday morning at uh, 10 o'clock. And then um, birthdays. Um, <clears throat> my mother-in-law is here, so she just had a birthday. 
So we'll sing her happy birthday, but also my sister, who is not feeling well, um, also had a birthday. And then a good friend of mine who is in um, Happy Camp, he's also traveling and having a birthday. Anybody else here having a birthday? Oh, Sharon. Okay, so yeah, it's kind of hard to get away from um, that, but at least you're not the only one, so that we can <laughs> sing to just everybody. So, um, well, good. Birthdays are a wonderful thing to celebrate, I believe, um, because God created us, and it's a special day, you know, and uh, so we'll sing happy birthday. We do two versions, the regular one, and then the kind of Christian um, version, I guess you could say. Not that the other one isn't, but anyway, so let's uh, sing these uh, happy birthday. So happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Donna, Wendy, Bob, and Sharon, <laughs> happy birthday to you, and happy birthday to you, unto Jesus be true. May God bless you and keep you your whole life through and many more. All right. So, yes. Happy birthday to all of you. <clears throat> now, usually I do um, a little bit of a prophecy update for our folks. Um, I don't really have one specifically for you, but you know what's going on if you're listening to things in the news. A lot of our news doesn't cover much of what is going on in the Middle East. And our, our, our puzzle piece, the, the missing piece, I guess you could, it's not really missing. The piece that really needs to be um, inserted for the Lord to come back is uh, the peace of Jerusalem. And right now, they are not seeing much in the way of peace. Um, we don't, again, hear about it much in our regular uh, television news, but believe it or not, we're in a war in Syria. Um, Iran, uh, through Hezbollah, and also even uh, Russia, um, is in that area right now. And we know the scripture says that Russia is going to have a hook in her jaw and be pulled down in there. Well, they're there, and they've been there for quite some time. Um, but they're also not doing very well in Ukraine, so they're pulling some of their troops out. Well, as they're pulling their troops out, then um, Iranian proxies move into those bases. And uh, so it's, it's really kind of an interesting period of, of time right now. Russia, it would seem, China, Iran, and Turkey, they're all kind of friends. Um, and they're literally trying to create an energy crisis and a food crisis. Well, it's working very well, but I don't think they're the ones that are creating it, so to speak. Satan is alive and powerful on this planet, and he is in control. You guys remember Adam and Eve, and God said, hey, I'm going to give you dominion over the earth. You get to rule this, and what did we do? We sinned and signed over the title deed to Satan. That's who's in control. And so when we see these things, we don't have to worry about them. Why? Because Jesus said, your redemption draws nigh. I'm coming. I'm just preparing a couple of things uh, and whatnot, in, in spite of the fact that the enemy thinks he's going to win. Yeah, you were going to say something? Oh, I thought I saw a hand up. Okay. Um, so, we need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and so keep them in your prayers daily, but keep your eyes on what's going on in the Middle East over there. It's very interesting, um, and... Uh, We'll just keep watching. So we'll do a little bit of music and that kind of stuff. So um, Matt, let's, uh, I'm going to have you come up. Let's all stand. Um, and maybe some of you guys remember uh, this particular um, song, but it's got some hand motions, which go, I said, and no, clap, no, clap, no, clap, no, clap, no, clap, clap. Okay, that's easy, which means you've got to find a partner. So find a partner. Now, if I don't see you doing this, then um, 
Uh, I'm going to make you come up here and, no, I'm kidding. So, but let's, let's sing, because we do need to remember our Lord and what he's done for us. So, when I remember Jesus died for me, I'll never go back anymore. Hallelujah. When I remember Jesus died for me, I'll never go back anymore. I said, and no clap, no clap, no clap, no clap, no clap, clap. I'll never go back anymore. Hallelujah. No clap, no clap, no clap, no clap, no clap, clap. I'll never go back anymore. Good job. Let's do it again. Oh, when I remember Jesus died for me, I'll never go back anymore. Hallelujah. When I remember Jesus died for me, I'll never go back anymore. I said, and no clap, no clap, no clap, no clap, no clap, clap. I'll never go back anymore. Hallelujah. No clap, no clap, no clap, no clap, no clap, clap. I'll never go back anymore. Good job. Give yourselves a round of applause. Well, you can have a seat if you wish. <clears throat> so I know you guys all have a photographic memory, which is why you don't have words this morning. So, but I think you guys probably know most of my songs. We have a few. So, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Amazing grace, how the sweet sound saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Blind, but now. My chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, like a flood, His mercy rang, and Talk my heart and grace my fears relieve. How precious did that grace appear? The hour I first believed, my chance. Love. 
shall soon dissolve like snow. Sun forbear shine, but God who called me here alone will be forever mine. Will be. I like that. You know, when God makes us a promise, it's like a real promise that's going to last, you know. And so he says that he will never leave us uh, or forsake us. And I appreciate that because um, most relationships go through some pretty tough times in life, but not with our Lord. So. <clears throat> We've been going through the book of 1 Corinthians, and Paul ends that speaking about the good news. The book of Corinthians, especially the first book, was really bringing a lot of correction to a lot of confusion in the church. And I like the good news being presented at the end of 1 Corinthians. Why? Because it's the good news. We are forgiven. So, and we're actually going to talk about forgiveness today. And that's what this next song is called, Forgiveness. You've probably heard it on the radio. It's the hardest thing to give away. It's the last thing on your mind today goes to those who don't deserve. It's the opposite of how you feel when the pain they've caused is just too real. It takes everything you have to say the word. Forgive me. in the face of all your pride it moves away the mad inside it's always anger's own worst enemy even when the jury and the judge say you got a right to hold a grudge whispers in your ear saying set it free give
We sure like receiving it, but it is a hard thing to do, isn't it? But God has been so gracious to us so <clears throat> that he has forgiven us. And he says, if we don't forgive others, then why should we be expected to receive it from him? You know, he wants us to be like him, that loving, kind, gracious heart. So because he is uh, so gracious to us and in obedience to what he's asking us to do, I know that you guys take tithe and offering. Um, so let's do that right now while uh, we sing um, the, uh, the next song. <clears throat> Which is, Lord, I come and I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Go ahead. And without you, I fall apart. deep comes my way and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. is, Lord, to join with you, that you would ask us to not only share the good news, but also, Lord, that you would allow us to be able to give back to you in a manner in which you have given to us. 
Father, thank you so much for the faithfulness of your church and not just giving of their time, but also the finances. We pray, Lord, that you would just bless that so that this ministry here could continue to reach out to those in Rogue River. And Lord, of course, back home in Happy Camp, we thank you, Lord, that you continue to do uh, an amazing work. May we be faithful, Lord, in trusting you with our things, with our money, with our lives. Knowing, Lord, that you have what is absolutely best in store for us. And so, Father, we give you our worship. We give you our tithes and offerings. Lord, we give you the rest of this service and pray, Lord, that you would once again just teach us about your forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I do see a couple little kiddos here. So is there Sunday school or do they get to listen to me? Sunday school it is. So you are welcome to go with Sharon and uh, enjoy Sunday school. I know they have toys back there, but I also know they've got great stories about Jesus. So <clears throat> the rest of you can turn to Matthew chapter 5. There you go. Okay. Yes, so if you could turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. And then after we're done, <clears throat> don't run away on me because we're going to do a communion. So um, Matthew chapter 5. In tying in with what have, has been going on in the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul had been sharing with a church that had some serious issues, and yet he still loved on them, he still cared for them, nurtured them just as if it was one of his kids, and I'm glad that the Lord allows us to gather together and together study the word so that we might kind of come to that same thing, not repeat their mistakes, their problems, their issues. We're fortunate. They didn't have Bibles back then. They might have had a couple of writings and letters from Paul or maybe even some of the other disciples, but they were kind of walking a little bit blind uh, until they got that direction. But I'm glad that God is gracious, that he is slow to anger. And if he's slow to anger, that means that he's very fast at forgiveness. And so we're going to talk about uh, forgiveness today. And so my title um, this morning is Practically Perfect, which is what I used to tell my mom that I was. I'm practically perfect in every way. I have a coworker that I still continue that tradition. And uh, she's like, yeah, right. And my mom would say, you remember that when you have kids. And I'm going to pray that you have one that is just like you. And I do. I, my daughter is right back here. She's practically perfect in every way, you know, right? <laughs> uh, so um, we're not perfect, are we? Um, but what is perfection? Well, if we go to the dictionary, Merriam-Webster, it says that perfection is the quality of being, and I don't understand this, as possible or free as possible 
from all flaws or defects. Now, I find that there's a problem with that. It says that it's the quality of being free as possible from all flaws or defects. Well, if you are as free as possible, that leaves it to interpretation, doesn't it? So then we could all walk around saying, well, I'm a good person. I'm practically perfect. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't, uh, you know, I don't steal anybody's stuff. I don't uh, cheat on my wife. I, I mean, there's a lot of things that I know are just wrong, not just in society, but even if we go to God's word, then I just don't do those things. I'm, I'm a good person. But are we? Well, according to Marion uh, Webster, yeah, you, you are. You are practic practically perfect because um, you have the quality of being as free as possible. Well, how possible is it for you to be sin-free? Well, we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. So this definition of perfection seems way out of line with what we know to be perfection. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me to see the words as possible. Because as much as lies with me, I know what the scripture says. That all the thoughts in my mind, in your mind, are evil all the time. The thoughts of man are that way. We think evil. We get corrected like Paul would do with the church of Corinth, but there is no as possible about it. If you're going to be perfect, you have to be perfect. And so Jesus, I think, addressed this idea in Matthew 5, um, which is very good for us to remember because a lot of people in Jesus' day thought that they were pretty good. Why? Because they went to church, they went to the synagogue, they listened to the word, they gave their money, they brought their lambs, they, they did all those things that were expected to do in church, so to speak, or at least in, in their time frame. So they thought that they were being pretty good, but they weren't. You know, years ago, I thought I was pretty good. I was working for a bank. I had at that point for probably about, probably about eight years. And I was getting kind of tired of the banking world, I guess you could say. Things weren't moving in the right direction, so I thought of myself as pretty good. Um, and there was a gentleman who, uh, well, I guess you could call him kind of a loan shark. Some of those businesses that you need a loan really quick, and you go and you run in there and look, I need $1,000, I gotta get this, all right, let's do a background check, uh, let's do a credit check, that kind of thing. Um, but you have to sell the loans. So he said, I want you to convince me to borrow money that I need it. So convince me, go for it. So I literally had to sell myself to him in order to get a job there. And I didn't do a very good job. I was on the spot. I, I hadn't really had to sell myself before. And so if you get to heaven and you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your savior, what would it be like for you to sell yourself to Jesus? Well, I, I'm a good person. Really, tell me about yourself. What did you do? Specifically, what did you do for me? Oh, I, I went to church a couple times. Even when the, the plate um, came around, I, I put a couple dollars in there or the box. You know, I, I put some money in it. I was good to uh, other people as well. I mean, I, I did a lot of good things. The sad part is, is Jesus doesn't want us to do good things. Even evil people, he would say, do good things. And so that's what Paul is essentially trying to convince the church in Corinth to do, to, to recognize what it means to be forgiven. Jesus doesn't have to sell that very um, hard because we all want to be forgiven. We all know what that means. We all like and understand what it's like to be forgiven. Well, I didn't get the job, so then I went to another uh, place a couple years later, 
and it was the worst interview of my life. I had learned to sell myself. I told the person, hey, this is exactly what I can do. But I ended up walking out of that interview at the end, shaking the person's hand and saying, if you don't understand what is in my resume and what I have told you that my abilities are, um, then I'm probably not the right person uh, for you. So thank you for your time. I really do appreciate it. Uh, and then I walked out the door. And about four hours later, they called me up and said, do you want the job? They needed somebody that was going to be strong. They needed somebody that was going to present. They knew about themselves. But what do you know about yourself? Are you just a good person? Or are you a forgiven person? Do you have Jesus in your heart? And I know you guys probably all do. But this is a great reminder of us of how we should be. Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 5. So if you want to turn there, um, I'm going to read through uh, the first portions of the book, um, but we're going to focus on verses 43 through 48. One day, as Jesus saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them. Now I'm using the New Living Translation if you're wondering um, where we're at as far as that goes, but you can continue to follow along in whatever version you have. Verse 3, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. So blessed are the poor in spirit. Are you a sinner? That's essentially what he, he's getting at. If you are a sinner, then I am going to bless you. It isn't poor as in, hey, I don't have any change. Um, and we're holding up a sign, you know, will work for food kind of thing. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about sin. Are you, is your spirit poor? Yes, because we've all sinned. We've all fallen short. We're all poor. <coughs> the Lord would say, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, and they realize their need for him, for the kingdom of God is theirs. Boy, what a joy that is to hear. You mean if I'm a sinner and all I need to do is realize my need for him? Yeah, we know that. We have the bigger picture because Jesus died one time for how many of sins? All of them. It's a kind of a hard concept um, sometimes uh, to understand that all of my sins are forgiven, not just the ones in the past and the ones that are happening now, but even the ones in the future when I trust in Jesus. It's also hard for me to understand when I see the person on the side of the road that's being a jerk, uh, maybe to his wife or um, the kid that just is rebelliously disobedient um, to his parents or you know, the employee that's disrespecting their boss, or you turn on the TV and you watch people just stealing and robbing and looting and, and going crazy. Did you know that all of their sins are forgiven? Yes, because Jesus died one time for how many of the sins of the world? All of them. So every single person on the planet is forgiven. Oh, well, if we're all forgiven, then let's just go to heaven, right? We have to make a choice. You are either for him, for Jesus, or you are against him. So really, Jesus makes it very simple for us to get saved, to be forgiven. It's already happened. You're already forgiven. But when you realize your need for him, in other words, I need Jesus to be in my life, then, boy, what a great thing because the kingdom of heaven is yours. Blessed. <clears throat> are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. I like that. Blessed are those who are humble, for they will inherit the earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing what is right, for the kingdom of heaven 
is theirs. I like that. So Paul says, hey, if you're a sinner, there's good news for you. If you're mourning, um, meaning over your sinfulness, uh, in a sense, and the depravity of the world, good news for you. If you're humble, you're not boasting or bragging about yourself all the time, um, then, hey, good news. Um, are you meek, which is strength under control? You have the strength, you have the ability to take over, but instead of beating it into somebody's head, you just gently, kindly move them in the proper direction. Um, are you longing for righteousness, especially in your own life? Are you full of mercy, especially toward other people? Uh, are you pure in heart? Are you a peacemaker? Um, are you persecuted even for the, for the sake of the Lord, meaning that you're out there sharing the good news, the gospel, God's grace? If, if this is you, then the kingdom of, of heaven is yours. Boy, what a, what a joy, except that the problem is, is you know, we call this the, the Beatitudes type chapter. This is the way we should be. But it's really hard for me to put myself realistically in that category without Jesus being in my life. So without Jesus, you know, then you'd have to say, hey, are you a sinner? Well, try and sell that to the Lord. Try and sell your perfection to Jesus. It's not going to happen, is it? He knows your heart, and you know your heart. So um, he would continue to go on in verse 11. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Boy, that makes me want to sign up. You know, you want me to become a Christian? Lord, you're asking me to be this particular way. But then you're saying at the end, and blessed are you when you are being persecuted. Well, I don't, I don't like that. And yet, are we being persecuted in today's world? You know, America seems to be kind of like the last little haven, in a sense, for Christians. But you know, it was interesting. I was listening to the news yesterday, um, or Friday night, rather. And in, at the University of New Mexico, there was a gal who came to speak there. And they were in an auditorium, um, as many of you have been. Uh, when you went to college, you would sit and listen to a professor give a speech. And they were talking about some conservative values and ideas uh, in regard to uh, you know, current world issues and, and things of that nature. And the auditorium had quite a few um, kids, youth in there, college-age folks in there. And uh, literally, a mob formed outside of the door of that particular auditorium and literally tried to break into that auditorium. What was their goal? What was their intent? What was their purpose? I have no idea. But it couldn't have been good. But yet we are seeing that in our nation today where we don't care. We don't want to hear about uh, evil and those kinds of things. It is. It is. It is kind of being pushed on us. And regardless of whether or not it's politically motivated, the motivation is still evil, isn't it? It is. And then just a day or two before that, I thought, well, you know, I came across another article of, um, oh, it's a cartoon, but it's made for adults. I didn't even much like cartoons growing up. Um, I didn't much care for, let's go outside and ride, you know, um, our bikes or go play or something like that. It was a lot better. But we live in a world where now the cartoons for adults include one, and I'm not going to mention what it is because I don't want to really give it any um, address, but it's basically a cartoon uh, where Satan, 13 years or 14 years prior, um, raped uh, a woman who is a practicing witch and then uh, has a baby with her and then finds out years later that this is his baby. So now he wants back in the picture so that he can train her up to be the Antichrist. 
That's happening in this world. That's, that's here in America. And I'm thinking, man, this is crazy. But this is what the woke generation, I guess you could say, is wanting. But is that of, is that of the Lord? No. Do you think that this is what people really want deep down in their hearts? No, not really. What they need to hear is the good news. Now, is it up to us to get up and shake our finger in their faces and say, shame on you? Yeah, that didn't really work. Hasn't really worked. When I went to Rogue River High School um, years ago, I was kind of that person. I was, you don't get your life right, you're going to hell. No, well, that's not exactly loving, is it? You know? What you can say, though, is, is, hey, no, I understand. Sin's fun for a season, but you're going to be real disappointed at the end because it's not going to really lead to anything satisfying in your life. If you want to be perfect, then you have to allow the Lord to be the Lord in your life, to lead you and guide you. And God would say, there's going to be times when people are going to lie about you. There's going to be times when they persecute you, whatever that looks like um, for being his followers. But he says in verse 12, be happy about it. Now, how many of you are like, man, that person came up to me and got in my face today. Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Lord. I don't. Usually what I do is I go home and complain to my wife. Do you know what happened to me today? Or a coworker, hey, you're never going to believe what happened to me today, you know? But here's the thing. Greater is he that is in us than he that's in this world. And so when we see this kind of stuff happening, we should rejoice. It doesn't mean, hey, let's have a party about it, because it doesn't feel good. But rejoice enough uh, to know or to understand that the world knows who you are. You remember the guys that uh, <clears throat> got beat up by the demons? Well, we know who Paul is, and we know who Peter is. We don't know who you are. Hey, when, when people come and persecute you, the enemy knows who you are. You should rejoice in the fact that people recognize you. Even the enemy recognizes you as a threat, and he wants to try and neutralize that. But what a joy and an honor, because it means that you have power over uh, the enemy, that the authority that Jesus promised you is real. And so that's a good thing. So be happy about it. It doesn't say celebrate. It says just be happy about it. Be very glad in your heart for great, uh, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. When are you going to get your reward? In heaven, which means you're going to, and I'm, I'm, ex I'm excited about that, okay? What is my reward here? To know that I'm going to heaven. This isn't the end. This is not what we're stuck with. I like that. There's a better end. The Lord is taking us from glory to greater glory. And that is an awesome thing. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. Yes, misery loves company, right? So, hey, if they were persecuted, then what's going to happen to you, you also are going to be persecuted. So don't expect a different outcome if you're going against the enemy because you are the salt of the earth. You know when you get that meal and you sit down and you're just like, oh, this looks so good, and you take a bite and it's either not sweet enough or it's not salty enough, and you're like, oh, what a drag. This is just kind of bland. God would say, I don't want you to be bland believers. I want you to be excited. I want you to, when, you, when somebody meets you, not that you're shaking their finger in their face, but they can count on you for a hug, count on you for support, to sit down with them, even though they're not a believer, not judging them for their sin, but saying, that's okay, the Lord forgives that. And what a joy it is. How many times did people come up to me and knowing that I'm a pastor and say, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I'm not the one that you have to be worried about. You know, there's nothing that I can do except point you in the direction of the one who you are offending. You're not offending me by using poor language. I know what that is. I used it when I was a kid. 
Yes, that's a hard habit to break. I get that. But I'm forgiven. So are you. So when you make a mistake, just say, oh, thank you, Lord, for forgiving me of that. But if we're around people and they cannot feel comfortable around us because they're afraid that we're going to judge them for their sin, then what's the point? When Jesus was sitting down, a whole crowd gathered around him here to hear this, right? And even though he was being um, corrective in his uh, teaching towards them, did they all get up and leave? Say, oh, um, that's it. We're out of here. I'm not listening to this. I get enough of this at home. You know? No. They wanted to hear the truth. Why? Because Jesus was so loving, so gracious. You guys know the woman at the well. What was her story? Hey, she had fallen into a lot of sin, huh? But what did he say to her? Go your way and I don't judge you either. Just go, go your way. We need to be that same way. We are salt. We are also uh, light, as the scriptures say. But if the salt has lost its flavor, can you make it salty again? Well, I can't say if I, I've ever tried, but I would say the answer to that being that Jesus is asking it is obviously no. You can't do it. Only Jesus can create that renewal. So it will be thrown out and trampled underfoot um, as worthless, useless, useless. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city on a hilltop cannot be hidden. <clears throat> the other night, uh, my wife was looking out the window in the middle of the night, and she saw a tiny, tiny little light flashing. What is that? I don't know, but it was dark. It was dark outside, but you could see that tiny little light. Jesus would say, that's you. You're the tiny little light. We're drawn to light, aren't we? This time of year is kind of nice because the temperatures come down. They're below 100, although today is a little less than that. But it's nice to feel comfortable. But you know what I don't like? It's getting darker in the evening. I don't like that. I love the light. I love to be uh, you, you know, out and about longer hours. But boy, we are drawn to light. We really are. And Jesus would say, you're the light of the world. You're salt. You are light. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. You know, what's the point of that? Instead, a lamp is to be placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. So you, by being a believer, are not supposed to be a judge. You're supposed to be a light. You're supposed to be a blessing for what is going on in your community. I am supposed to be a blessing to those in my community. Well, <clears throat> in the same way, verse 16, let your good deeds shine for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. What? You mean I'm not going to get any praise for this? That's not what it's about. It's about people praising the Lord for what you did. I don't go around still to this day and, and praise my, uh, my mom for helping to get me saved. I can remember her leading me in that prayer, but I don't go, oh, thank you, mom, I'm saved because of you. No, I thank the Lord because all she did was lead me in that direction. <coughs> so that's really what it means to be a light, is to be a leader. And what do leaders do? They lead. They don't follow. They don't turn woke. They don't do what the rest of the world is doing. They lead. They set the example. They are the salt. They are the light. Why does the world continue to go deeper and deeper and deeper in sin? Why? Because sin is only fun for a season. It means whatever they're doing now isn't going to bring them joy, so they've got to do something different. And well, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. They are chasing something that will never satisfy but I have something. You guys have something that we know satisfies. And so Jesus would say, I want you to be this way. Verse 17, don't misunderstand why I've come. I didn't come to abolish the law. We need the law, don't we? If we didn't have the law, what would the traffic be like on I-5? 
probably wouldn't be moving very fast because there'd be accident after accident after accident. If we had no law, you know, the place would, we've seen what happens when there's no law enforcement, even though there's laws on the books. But what is the job of the law? Does it fix your problem? No, it really doesn't. All it does is point to the problem. There are too many people going too fast on the road, so we're going to put up a law that says you can only go 65. Well, then how are you going to make people do that? Well, we're going to put people in cars that go really fast that have lights, and we'll fine you. We'll make a judgment against you. Jesus said, I'm going to take all that judgment. So do whatever you want. No. He says, I want you to be this way. I want you to be salt and light. I want you to follow the things of the law, do the good things that are there, but not in a sense of, oh, I have to fulfill the law, but rather the law has already been fulfilled in me. I didn't come to abolish the law. It still needs to be there. We need to know what's right and wrong. Or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. What was the law? To point to the one who was perfect. So are you practically perfect? According to Merriam-Webster, you are. But according to the Word of God, you are not. So who is? Well, when we look at the Word, who is the only sinless person? You know, there were two sinless people on the planet. Adam. Adam was sinless to begin with. And then who was the second perfect person? We know Jesus. <clears throat> Matthew will get into that. He says here, I came to fulfill the law. I came to accomplish its purpose. The law points out sin, but it doesn't fix it. I came to fix it. So Jesus accomplished the law by providing a way of forgiveness. And that is so cool. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So, if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's law and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So when we help people to understand the truth, and the purpose of the law, then boy, we're helping Jesus in uh, the presentation of, of forgiveness, which is also awesome that he would include us. Verse 20, but I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, is he saying that the Pharisees and the religious leaders are perfect? No. But they, do they keep the law? Oh, absolutely. But they still failed, probably before they became that, and even during that, because he had a little scuffle with them, didn't he? So he said, unless you're even at that level, there's no way you can enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, you and I don't have a chance then, unless we are um, going to believe in Jesus as our Lord, as our leader. Verse 21, you have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder, if you commit murder, you're subject to judgment. But I say, if you even are angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. Or, you know, you've got that hatred in your heart. We can be angry at sin, but not the person. Okay? They're just deceived. If you call someone an idiot or a fool, as the scriptures would say, the idea here is worldly, then you're actually passing judgment on them. You're saying, you are worldly, there's no chance for you. Are, is your job to judge? No, you're to be light, you're to be salt. I'm to be light, I'm to be salt. I'm supposed to lead in a manner that people are like, yum, all right, I can follow that, I can be, I can be part of that. But it's not up to us. And all of our judgment was poured out on Jesus, so it's not our job. It's really the Holy Spirit's job to do that. Uh, well, Jesus said, if you call them worldly, a fool, an idiot, then you're in danger of being brought before the court. And what will it say? What will the court say? 
Well, have you ever done anything similar? Oops. Well, and what's, what's the, I mean, yeah, we're all sinners. Okay. <clears throat> if you curse someone, then you're in danger of the fires of hell. Jesus said, if you don't forgive, then you won't be forgiven. What's the point of forgiveness? Just that, forgive. So if you're going to want forgiveness, but you're not willing to give it, there's a problem. Verse 23, so if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar, go and be reconciled to that person, then come and offer your sacrifice to God. When you are on the way uh, to court uh, with your adversary, settle your differences quickly. You'll save a lot of money by not having to pay the lawyers. Oh, wait, that's not in there. Uh, otherwise, your accuser may hand you over to the judge uh, who will then hand you over to an officer and you will be thrown into prison. If that happens, you surely won't be free again until you have paid your last penny or the last penny. Verse 27, you have heard the commandment say, you must not commit adultery, but I say to anyone uh, who looks at a woman with lust al already committed uh, adultery um, with in his heart. So uh, if your eye or uh, even your good eye causes you to lust, then gouge it out or throw it away. Does he really want you to remove your eyeball uh, because you're lusting after someone? No. Uh, what good does that do? It, but the idea is this is really a bad thing. And if you won't gouge your eyeball out, which would be astronomically difficult. Um, I mean, that's what he's saying is, he said, don't do that. Don't go there because it's going to cause a lot of pain and a lot of problem. So stay away from that kind of stuff. Uh, it would be better if you could do that and that, that would, you know, settle uh, the score, so to speak. So then you won't be thrown into hell. If your hand, <clears throat> even your stronger hand causes you to sin, then cut it off and throw it away. Yeah, that's probably not going to happen either. We like our hands right where they're at. Um, so Jesus is saying, you got to take sin seriously. You got to look at this as, as pretty brutal. Sin is devastating to the body, to the heart, to the soul. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than uh, to be thrown into hell. Verse 31, you have heard the law say that a man can divorce his wife merely by giving her a written notice of a divorce. So she salted your food too much or maybe left it out. You can just like, okay, I'm tired of this. Your cooking stinks. We're divorced. There you go. That was the law then. And it seems really rather silly, but uh, um, that, that's all it took to get a divorce back then. Now it's a little more difficult, but has that stopped people? No. They're willing to throw everything away and start over just to get rid of somebody that they tend to now hate. It's really sad. It's really sad to see that kind of a breakup. <clears throat> but Jesus would say, verse 32, but I say that a man who divorces his wife unless she has been unfaithful causes her to commit adultery. Anyone who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. Look, if you don't do it God's way, and what is God's way? Don't get divorced, okay? Because then you're, you're compounding the problem by adding sin to it. I don't care whose fault it, it is, Jesus, even in the case of uh, somebody who is cheated on their spouse, would, I would say, prefer you to forgive and see if there can't be some uh, resolution, some correction brought to that issue, and then some restoration. Wow, what a blessing it is when people say, you know what, I know that you made a mistake. I know that you blew it, but I choose to forgive, not I choose to go to court and get rid of you. Because then the process starts all over again and you have, you know, dating wasn't easy the first time. But finding that person that you know that you love, you really do, even when they make a mistake, to go to them and say, I forgive you. Not the easiest thing to do, but boy, what a message it sends to the rest of the world. Verse 33, you have also heard our ancestors were told um, that you must not break your vow. Hey, keep your word, your word. 
you must carry out the vows uh, you make to the Lord. But I say, don't make any vows. I can't make any promises. Hey, when are you going to be home? My wife asked me. I can't tell you because it's I could get an ambulance call at any time. If I tell you, I'm going to be home at five o'clock and then I'm not there. Oh, you lied to me. Not that she's acting that way or does, but you, you know how it is when somebody makes a promise to you and don't do the same to the Lord. Oh God, if you get me out of this, that's usually one of the best ones we use, isn't it? If you get me out of this, then I will, I'll be in church every Sunday. I will, you know, I'll do whatever. I don't care. I'll, I'll be bleeding to death and I will never... How many of you have kept those promises? Well, only me. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really interesting how we do that in some regard. And it leads you over and over to just reiterate what all the promise, promise, and then you end up doing what you said. And that's really pretty bad, isn't it? It is. When we make the Lord a promise, you know, um, I think, first of all, he understands that we are failures, you know, but he still forgives because we are forgiven of how many of our sins? All of them. So he already knows that in advance. I like the fact that Jesus is our intercessor with the father. He's kind of our high priest. You say we would go to the priest, we would make our requests. The priest would go to the altar and make, uh, you know, uh, penitence, you could say, by shaking the blood on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. We don't have to do that anymore because Jesus' blood covers that. That's why we're going to do communion afterwards because we know he forgives us. But I also know that he doesn't answer our prayers in the way that we often pray. I can remember as a kid, I prayed for a broken leg simply for what? Well, because I want everybody to come and sign my cast. That, was, that looks really cool. Everybody giving you attention and all that other stuff. And then I saw somebody get a broken leg. Guess what? I don't want a broken leg. I'm really glad that Jesus did not answer that prayer for me. You know, Jesus knows our heart, but where we have the problem is our heart, isn't it? So Jesus is saying, hey, I want you to be a little more in tune with where your heart is at. Don't make me promises that you already know in your heart. You might have a hard time keeping. So when you make God a promise, if you're truly going to make him a promise, then do it. Be um, faithful to him. Uh, keep him, number one. And do not say by earth or by um, his footstool. Do not say by Jerusalem, for Jerusalem is the city um, of the great king. Do not even say by my head, for you can't uh, turn one uh, hair white or black. Well, I've got a lot of white hair. I've got a few black ones left, um, but I can't do anything about that. I can't even cause it to grow. You know, I tried the Rogaine stuff that you put on it. It didn't work, you know. So Jesus would say, you're making promises in silly ways. Oh, I swear that I'm going to do this by Jerusalem or even by my own head. Off with my head if I don't keep my... That's silliness. It's better that we just simply say, you know what? I am going to do the best I can. If it's coming home at five o'clock, hey, I'm going to do the best I can, but I will communicate that to you. But if it's a promise to the Lord, Lord, you know that I'm a failure, so I'm going to ask you for some help. I'm going to need you to intervene here because I'm not very good at this, you know, um, but I would like to keep a promise. I would like to keep you a promise. I will try my best to do it. Help me to do that. Do not even say by my head, you don't have any power over your own head. Just simply say, yes, I will, or no, I won't. Let's keep it simple. Can you do that for me? Yes. The Lord already knows your heart. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. So then you're trying to sell yourself. You're trying to sell what is very possibly a lie. And Jesus would say, I want you to stay away from that. So verse 38, <clears throat> you've heard the law, <clears throat> that the law says uh, punishment must match the injury. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I say, resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on your right cheek, well, offer the other one. It doesn't very, sound very fun, but Jesus said, hey, let's try and settle these things by not just beating each other up. If you're sued in court, 
uh, and your shirt is taken from you, then give them your coat too. Be gracious. And that's the idea of forgiveness is give it all away. If a soldier demands that you carry his gear uh, for a mile, eh, carry it too. Let him know that you're caring at the fact that he's having to do his job too. He's just carrying out what his boss is telling him to do. So go two miles with him. Give those who ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. <clears throat> that can be hard in these days. But here we are with our kind of final end of things. Um, Paul would say here, um, do you love your enemies? Uh, you know, uh, or Jesus, not Paul. Paul was teaching the Corinthian church. Matthew is saying this, but Jesus himself is saying this. That we need to really love our enemies. It's easy for me to love you guys. But it would be difficult for me to sit in an auditorium like that other conservative gal while people are trying to bash the door down to come and maybe do harm to me. Paul was telling the church in Corinth, hey, I, I suffer for the Lord. I suffer more than all, all of you. Not to brag, but hey, I believe in what I am doing. I believe that serving God is the most important thing that we can do. So as a church, Paul brings correction, but he, at the end, he also brings the good news. That's kind of what Jesus is doing here at the end of this uh, series here. You have heard the law say, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. That's what the law really said. Love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. And Jesus would say, uh-uh, that's not my law. That's man's. <coughs> but I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both uh, evil and good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, essentially it says big deal. That's, that's not really that difficult. Even corrupt Tax collectors do that much. <clears throat> I wonder if that's the part of the training with the new 87,000 that's going to get appointed that they have to go through, you know. I, I doubt it. Um, but if you love only those who love you, big deal. Even the tax collectors can do that. Verse 47, if you are kind only uh, to your friends, again, big deal. How is that any different than anyone else? Even the pagans do that. <clears throat> but you are to be perfect. What are you to be? Perfect. Now, Jesus' definition of perfection here is not the Webster's Dictionary, which is as possible. Yeah. Could you possibly translate that as uh, you know, instead of being here in perfect terms, love them and be peaceful to them and, and, and express it, especially in a situation Yeah, that's a good question. So how could we resolve that kind of issue? Um, first of all, I don't know exactly what I would do in a situation where somebody's trying to break down the door. But I did think about that the other day. What would I do if I was the professor, you know, or even in a church setting? I'm the pastor. What am I going to do? You know, probably the best thing for us to do is call upon the name of the Lord. As a conservative, and the gal that was there is a believer uh, I understand. Just get down on your knees and start praying. Mm -hmm. I can remember a story that my mom told me about a lady who was faced with a really bad situation. There was somebody that was going to come and attack her, and she remembered only a portion of a verse that God is like a mother hen who puts his uh, wings around um, the little chicks and protects us. All she could remember is it had something to do with like a chicken, but the only thing that came to her mind was feathers. And so she started yelling, feathers, 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 feathers. <laughs> and the person that was coming after thought she was nuts and turned around and walked off. Okay? So <clears throat> I don't know what I would do in that kind of a situation, but I just know that I would probably just pray. I don't know. It's, it's an interesting thing. 
But here, what does Jesus ask us to do? He says, I want you to be perfect. Well, how perfect? Because Merriam-Webster says that I need to be perfect just as much as I can be, as much as possible for me to be. And Jesus would say, no, 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 not Marion Webster. I want you to be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Whoa, that's far from Marion Webster. So then Jesus, you're, you're ending this chapter and you're saying that I have to be perfect. How do I get there? That's the point. You can't. I want you to be all these things. I want you to be this way, but you can't. But blessed are you if you see your need for me. And if you have a need for Jesus, then what does the world have? The same need. Are you glad to be saved today? Oh, I am, most definitely. Are you glad that you are forgiven? Oh, most definitely. Do you think that they need to hear the word out there? Yes, absolutely. Do you think that the church that Paul was talking to in Corinth, after being corrected and, and all these things, nope, you're not doing this right, you're not doing that right, you're not doing this right, but I want you to remember the gospel, the good news. What's that? You are forgiven. In other words, now go your way and sin no more. The rest of the world wants to hear that same thing. <clears throat> Paul would tell us in the book of Colossians, as we finish this up here, that since you've been raised with Christ, I want you to set your mind on things above. When you're thinking about Jesus, a lot of people will say, oh, you're so heavenly minded, then you're no earthly good. No. I would say that it's actually, unless you're heavenly minded, then you are no earthly good. What did Jesus do for you? When I can set my mind on things above like Jesus told me to, then I know what forgiveness brings. What does forgiveness bring? Not more earth, not more sin, not more destruction. It brings heaven into the picture. Hey, you have been raised with Christ, so set your mind on things above. We are to be heavenly minded. <clears throat> where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not just on the things here of earth. You died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, Impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, um, which is idolatry. Um, well, because these, um, the wrath of God is coming for those things. Jesus is going to put an end to sin. And he says, it's coming. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Verse 7, Colossians chapter 3. You used to walk in these ways in the life that you once lived. But now you must rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on a new self which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. You were created in the image of God, and we got to return to that image. What did Jesus create you to be? Perfect. But what did you do? What did I do? Oh, man. So then what do we do? We repent. What does repent mean? I'm acting like this. I'm doing these things. Repent just means to do a 180. I'm walking away from those things. It doesn't mean that I have to give or I have to do a bunch of stuff in order to get forgiveness. Jesus says it's already done. Mm -hmm. Here, there is no, in, in this creation uh, God put together and in the light of his forgiveness, there is no Gentile or Jew. There's no circumcised or uncircumcised. There's no barbarian or Scythian. There's no slave or free. But Christ is all and in all. 
He's right there with you. All you have to do, all your sins are forgiven. All you have to do is say, yes, Jesus, I want you to be in my life. What a cool thing. That makes it so much easier for me because I don't know what the value of the sin is that I just committed. If we had to pay, literally pay for our sin, how, how do you do that? The wages of sin is what? Death. That sin is going to cost my life. How do I pay that back? I can't. Be ye perfect as your Father is perfect. Oh, I, I, I can't do that. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy, dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bear with one another, and forgive one another. Even if any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. What if we could literally do that? What if we could forgive as much as Jesus has forgiven you? What if every time somebody came against us, said, you know what, can I just give you a hug? I, I've been forgiven and I, I'm just going to forgive you. I don't need your forgiveness. You're right. You need Jesus' forgiveness. But what can I do to help you? How much different an approach, a kind and gentle, humble, gentle, patient, um, a, a person that bears uh, another person's issue or grievance. Boy, if we can forgive them, I think the world would change drastically because we would be putting Jesus first. <clears throat> and then closing here, verse 14, over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So Jesus would say, I want you to be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, how do I do that? Do I have to give? Do I have to go? Do I have to, you know, minister in this way, that? No. You know what it really takes? Something really simple, which Paul would write here in verse 14, over all of these things, I want you to put on love. How do I do that? How do I become a loving person? Because that's what binds everything together in perfection, in unity. So how do I put on love? Well, I know how to love, but how do I put it on? How do I appear to everybody as clothed in love? Jesus would say, in the word, that God is love. How do I present myself as being completely clothed in God? That's a difficult question, isn't it? It means I have to start acting in a manner that presents that way. How? By being loving, kind, compassionate, gentle, patient, and forgiving. How do I do that, Lord? Because I'm not very good at that. Jesus would say in Romans that we need to be transformed by the what? Renewing of our mind. It's changing your mind and saying, I am going to purpose in my mind to do what's right. It's not an easy thing to do because we're kind of addicted to sin and doing things wrong. David, he would even pray, Lord, even when I don't understand my secret sin, when I don't understand what I'm doing wrong, would you forgive me of that? Would you teach me how to do things right? Boy, we need to learn love, don't we? We need to learn how to put that on. Thank God for guys like David who failed and then were quick to ask for forgiveness because he would write in Psalm one hundred and. Uh, 19 verse 9, how does a person keep their way pure? By being in the word. I'm proud of you guys. I'm proud of the folks back home or those that tune in online getting together every week and just saying, I'm going to be in the word because it's going to help me. We need to be in the word, in the word, in the word so that we might what? See Jesus and put on love. If we can do that, then we will change the world. What if in your question, the entire audience in that uh, classroom 
actually got up, let the people inside and said, yeah, come on in. We want to hear what you have to say. And then listen to what they had to say. And then turned around and said, you know what? Even though we disagree, we love you. And then gave a hug. We're so used to fighting with one another. We're going to fight for what's right. And is that what Jesus did? No, he didn't. He just loved them. Hey, what's your sin? I already know what it is, but what's your sin? Oh, Lord, I am such a failure. I know. But guess what? I don't condemn you. Now go your way and sin no more. That's really the key is we've got to expect that other people get the same grace that we do. That's putting on love. It's being just as gracious as our creator in heaven who created us to be like him. He wants us to be that way. So we need to put on love. We need to put on Jesus Christ. And the best way I know of doing that is taking communion. So we're going to do that. Um, I'm going to play uh, this song and we can sing together and then I'll let you go. But I think it's an important thing for us to do so that we remember our own sin and how forgiven we truly are. Yeah, if you guys want to come up and, and serve that, we'll sing this while we're going along. Oh, come to the altar. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling bring your sorrow and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling
she wait for the crown tell the world of the treasure And Lord Jesus, we truly have found a treasure in you. What a privilege it is to know that you would forgive me. And Father, this morning as we take the bread, which was your body broken for us, and this cracker that represents that work that you did for us, told us to do this often in remembrance of you. And Father, this morning we thank you for your broken body. Where ours was supposed to hang, Lord, you hung. You were perfect and we have failed. But you have given to us forgiveness. Clothe us, Lord, in your righteousness and in your love so that we might go out and share the good news that we have been forgiven. And so can anyone who believes in you. Let's take and eat together. Father, we thank you for the cup this juice which represents your blood which was shed for us. You didn't have to do this, Lord, but in your grace and in your mercy, you were quick to forgive as we should be. And you weren't practically perfect. Lord, you are perfect. You are perfection. And although we cannot attain that, in and of ourselves. Lord, you were the sacrifice. You were the one who has forgiven the world of all of its sin. And you simply just ask us to come and be a part of you and your way. Thank you, Lord, for making it easy for us. May we also make it easy for others to understand that they are forgiven so much as lies with us. Thank you, Lord, that we enjoy your forgiveness. May we also be quick to forgive. Let's take and drink. Well, thank you guys for coming and joining together. Um, I'm glad that I could be here with you and just hang out. Remember to continue to pray for those on our list um, and your list. Um, but also, as we go our way this week, remember how much you were forgiven. And then go, when you see people doing evil things, pray for them. But also, put on Jesus Christ. Put on love. Act even as Jesus would do, and come, maybe if he's telling you to intervene in that situation, come with a hug, come with love, come with humbleness, graciousness, and be forgiving. And I'll tell you what, I think if we can really do that, if we can get a hold of that, it will change the world, even as Jesus has changed our lives. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, God bless you. Have a great week, and we will see you at another time. Oh, you bet. <laughs>